before I get into this, first of all, if you're wondering why I'm here, Pastor not, Pastor is actually in Oklahoma preaching. He's picking up his grandkids, preaching for a friend of his in Oklahoma. Josh is actually preaching for a smaller church in Humble that I was supposed to preach, uh, but then Pastor is leaving, so I moved over here and he went over there. So all three of our pastors are preaching somewhere this morning. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty neat that we can send off our pastors to preach at different churches and spread the word and that people want to hear them, us, you know, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then of course you got stuck with me and you're welcome because uh, I'll be honest with you. I've, after stepping down from Ford or stepping up, however you want to say, see it, I love teenagers. So it felt like stepping down a little bit, um, but uh, not preaching very often, so I might end up preaching for a good two hours this morning. Just, I have it in me, and it's been sitting there for weeks, so you're just going to have to deal with it. If you're tired, you might just take a break, go get some coffee, come back. Uh, we might have an intermission. I don't know, but uh, there is a, this, mi this message has been on my heart for, uh, well, I'll say all week, but it's feel like it's just one of those things that's, uh, well, you'll see it as we go, we go along, but let me pray and get into this. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to talk about you. And what a privilege that we have here in America, right here in this moment, to be able to stand for, or sit, stand freely in this building and talk about your goodness. Lord, we are so privileged and we take it for granted so much that we have this opportunity to, to hear your word, to study your word freely without persecution and to be able to draw closer to you freely. Lord, it is a privilege. And I just pray that you would work through this message. I feel like this message is going to relate to most of us, if not all of us, at some point. And I just pray that you would speak through me. Lord, let it not be my thoughts, but let it be your thoughts. Let it not be my words, but let it be your words, Father. And I just thank you for the opportunity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, old Satan was having a garage sale because he needed to get rid of some things. You know, we've all been there. Uh, he looked in his garage and he really realized that some tools he had just uh, weren't as useful as others, and so he put them up for sale. And he pulled out envy, put it out, put a price on it, put deceit, put a price on it, malice, enmity, uh, thoughtlessness, and many other tools. And much like how uh, Milwaukee tools are inferior to DeWalt tools, um, uh, there were some tools that were more pricey than others. In fact, there was one that was overvalued than any of the others, like way higher. And so um, there was a guy looking at this, and he says, why do you want so much for this tool? Uh, and Satan said, this tool, this tool has always be, been the mo my most useful tool. You can see it. It had more wear and tear than the rest. Uh, it's used as a wedge to get into a man's mind with all other means. Uh, when all other means fell, uh, practically every human being has had this tool used on them, although very few know that it's the devil wielding it. And the bidder asked, well, what do you call this tool? And the devil said, I call this tool d discouragement. And so I really want to talk about discouragement this morning because it is something that the enemy throws at us that we all have been affected by it. In fact, Pastor just preached Sunday about bitterness and this Tuesday and Wednesday about it. And I feel like, and I think about bitterness and other, uh, other struggles that we have, and I feel like it all begins with the seed of discouragement. And so I wanted to look at discouragement, look at the root of this, because if you think about it and how much we, you have been discouraged in your time, you think about things like uh, you don't get the promotion that you felt you deserve, discouragement. Your husband wasn't as sensitive as you would have liked him to be about a particular thought you had. Discouragement. Your son or daughter did something that you thought they would never do. Discouragement. You don't feel appreciated. You worked hard on a project for it not to turn out the way you planned. Uh, maybe you've had a really hard time finding a job. You just can't find a job. Discouragement. And the list goes on and on. And the moment the Lord puts this, put this topic, it's funny, the mo moment I thought about this topic at the beginning of the week, I felt like everybody, a lot of my family members, a lot of friends had conversations with, with me, not even knowing that this is where I was going, talking about ways they've been discouraged. And a lot of us may be going through it right now. I, I believe we are. Um, in fact, this week, 
Uh, I'm trying to think what day it was. I don't remember. It was earlier this week. I had an aunt who's been struggling uh, with Alzheimer's for 12 years. And then uh, during that 12 years, her daughter, my cousin, who's 62, has been t taken, uh, took her in to watch her. They didn't put her in her home. So for the last 12 years, have been in her home. Well, she got sick. She got put in the hospital, the, the daughter, uh, and she was on a ventilator for 11 days and she passed away just recently. And in three hours after that, the mom who has Alzheimer's took a turn for the worse and passed. So in the same day, the daughter and the mom passed away. Talk about discouragement. I mean, there's people you love and you care about, and you all probably, you've been through similar situations with loss or a job or whatever. Uh, discouragement runs rampant in our humanity. Uh, it's so prevalent, it seems to have become a natural part of our lives. In fact, I think it's become such a natural part of our life that when we have these moments of contentment, we look for discouragement because we just assume we're supposed to be discouraged. I mean, have you ever been in that place where you're like, everything just seems to be going right and you're just waiting for the bottom to fall out? And I think that's the seed that, that has been planted that, that really will rock us if we're not careful. And there's one thing that we have to learn, which is pretty important about discouragement, is there is no exemption card. There is no exemption card from it. Every single one of us has going, is going to go through it, is going through it, or have gone through it. I mean, just raise your hand. Let's be honest. Raise your hand that this week you have been in a moment of discourage, or you've been discouraged. Yeah, all over the, the place. Right, and they're all different situations, but we've all experienced it. And so, so like seven years ago, maybe eight years, I've been I've been with the church nine years. I think it was my first summer with the church. Uh, most of you know we have uh, in our new Candy Campus we have a camp, 110 acres, and we maintain it ourselves. And I remember the first summer I was here, we were cutting a tree down. Some of you guys remember this, uh, but we were cutting a tree down, and we were, we put it in like. Just like you normally do, you cut it in two foot sections so you can haul it away. And you know, me, me being the new guy, I felt like I had to prove my strength and rather than get help, you know, so I got to grow those logs and bear hug them to put them on the trailer. And that's what I did. And I handled it well, first of all. Uh, anyways, but once it was over, I looked at my arms and they were all scratched up because I didn't wear long sleeves, which I've learned now. Uh, it's all scratched up and I was bleeding and I began to wash it and, and I washed it and I went home and that night I woke up the next day and I was covered from head to toe in poison ivy and my face was swollen shut. Like my eyes, I could not even see. I have a picture somewhere. It's, it's terrible. And I learned real quick about poison ivy and I've had it before, but never that bad. That was the start of a six month battle. And I'm not even exaggerating. Six months it took me to get rid of that. And it would, it would almost go away and then it would come back with a vengeance and I just couldn't. And talking about discouragement over and over and over, just coming at me. And then now to this day, I even struggle with poison ivy. Like if anybody says poison ivy, I'm out the door and running the opposite way. Uh, I walk away from the woods now because of that, because I don't want to b battle with it. In fact, just like a year ago or six months ago, I shook somebody's hand on our property who had some on his glove, and I dealt with it for three weeks. It was infested in my arm. It was crazy. Uh, just a couple, or last week, I was moving some brush, just helping somebody else, and I got a little bit right there. I don't know how it got through my shirt, but it's just one of those things. But poison ivy is, uh, first of all, that's one of those questions when you go to heaven, you're like, God, why? Like mosquitoes, why? Why is there poison? How is this benefiting us any, in any way? But, but I started thinking about poison ivy and, and discouragement and how they kind of coexist in, in their meaning and, and what they represent. Because discouragement, if we feed it, it will become an ivy in our lives that will saturate every part of us if we continue to feed discouragement. And it'll saturate us, and it'll affect us, and it'll mess with us. Uh, discouragement begins with a single thought, and if we feed it, it spreads like an ivy, producing bitterness, depression, anxiety. Uh, discouragement also grows in solitude and quickly. A lot of times when we get discouraged, we want to shut everybody off, including God, and then it just festers in us, and it begins to grow, and it begins to saturate our lives. But it begins with a thought, and those thoughts grow and shift how we feel. Those feelings affect our ability to rationalize, to think, to act. And poison ivy usually gets us because we either don't see it or we don't think to look for it. 
And this is why we have to today, we have to shed light on discouragement so that we can avoid the pitfalls that it brings. Because if we don't look for it, we don't recognize it, we just deal with it, that's when it starts growing and we don't handle it. We either feed it or we defeat it. Or it defeats us when we feed it. But I want to look at the life of Elijah. We're going to be in 1 Kings 18. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. 1 Kings 18, I want to look at the life of Elijah because Elijah, uh, there's this incredible story and many of you read it, uh, of his life, that we can start seeing all these things that we're talking about unfold. In fact, in this story, is, we're gonna, it's, and I'll get there. I'm really excited about the story. I love this story. So Elijah was one of the, it was a major prophet. He's arguably one of the, the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, but he, uh, so in, in Israel, there was this battle going on between God versus this little god Baal. Uh, in fact, so people wanted to believe in this false god, and Elijah is trying to open up their minds and open their hearts and say, no, you have to follow the one true God. Uh, and he's fighting against this the spiritual battle and this war in this area. And the king Ahab is, um, he's kind of st stuck in the middle of it because his wife is actually kind of the ambassador of this false god, Jezebel. And so she really promotes that, and the kingdom is getting infiltrated. And Elijah knew if he wanted to make an impact in this area, he had to first get a hold of the king, right? And so he requested a meeting with the king so that he could talk to him and start pouring into him to minister to him. And this is, this is what ends up happening. This story kind of unfolds during this meeting, starting in verse 20. I'm going to end up reading a lot, so you guys are going to have to bear with me. So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and gathered the prophets of Mount Carmel. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? Man, that, I could stop right there and just be done with it and ask you, how long are we going to waver? How long are we going to let discouragement? How long are we going to let the things of this world, all of this dictate who we are instead of allowing God to be the God of our life. And this is the battle, and this was thousands of years ago, but this is so prevalent today. Uh, verse 8, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people didn't answer him a word. Verse 22, then Elijah said to the people, I am the only remaining prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. They are two they are to choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces, and place it on the wood, but not light it on fire. I'll prepare the other bull and place it on the wood, but not light it on fire. Then you will call on the name of your God, and I will call the name of the Lord. And the God who answers with fire, he is God. And all the people answer, okay, let's do this. That's fine. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, since you are so numerous, choose, your, choose for yourself one bull and prepare it. Prepare it first, then call on the name of your God, but don't light the fire. Just to give you an idea. This is Elijah over here on his side, representing the Lord. And then on this side, there's 450 prophets of Baal. So he's not just talking to one other guy. He's talking to a whole army, right? And so this conversation. And Elijah even gets a little cocky in this, which I kind of like. Uh, so verse 26, so they took the bull that he gave, prepared it, called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Baal, answer us. But there was no sound, no one answered, and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them. He said, shout loudly, for he's a god. Maybe he's thinking it over. Maybe he has wandered away. Or maybe he's on the road. Perhaps he's sleeping and will wake up. They shouted loudly and cut themselves with knives and spears according to their customs until blood gushed over them. So they're calling. Nothing's happening. Elijah's getting a little cocky, right? He's got some stones. I don't know if you can say that behind a pulpit, but I just did. Uh, he's got some stones. He's, he's got some courage and boldness. Listen, I was youth ministry 18 years. You can't take it out of me. Uh, so, man, he's got some courage. He's calling down. And he's, saying, he's being sarcastic. He's calling them out. He's saying, and then they're panicking. All 450 guys, they're to the point where they're cutting themselves just to try to get the attention of their God. And so, all afternoon they kept on raving until the offering, the evening sacrifice, but there was no sound, no answer, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near me. He says, come here, let me show you something. And the faith that he had, 
the faith he had in this moment. So all the people approached him. Then he repaired, or repaired the Lord's altar that had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of tribes of the son of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel will be your name. And he built an altar with the stones in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold about four gallons. Then he arranged the wood, cut the bull, and placed it on the wood. He said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the offering to the burnt uh, to be burned on the wood, which is pretty incredible. They're using water in the first place because they're in a three-year drought. So he's really rubbing this thing in at this point. 34, verse 34, then he said a second time, and they did it a second time, and then he said a third time, and they did it a third time. So the water ran around all the altar. He even, f he even filled the trench with water. So he's setting up the stage, right? It's saturating it with water. He's trying to help them realize that this thing is going to be impossible. And then here it happens in 36. At the time of the offering, the evening sacrifice, the prophet Elijah approached the altar and said, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and I am your servant. And that all your word, I have done all these things. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that this people will know that you, the Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the Lord fire fell and consumed the burnt offering. Uh, the wood, the stones, the dust, it, li it licked up the water that was in the trench. Then all the people saw it. They fell face down and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The greatest throwdown in Old Testament, and God prevailed, right? Spoiler alert, it happened. It's pretty incredible to me that Elijah's right in the middle of this. In fact, right after this, uh, I said three-year three, three drought, right after this, because of Elijah's faithfulness, the Lord brought rain to that area. So all the 450 plus the whole probably kingdom saw what just happened through Elijah and through the Lord and saw this incredible thing happen, the fire take up, and then the rain come, and God provided, and then Baal was smushed in the, that fire, which is pretty incredible, and Elijah was right there in the middle of it. It's important for us to realize that, that Elijah was on cloud nine, should have been. Right? He should have been, man, I was a part of that. I was just used by God in this mighty way. I would be riding that way for days to come. Right? It's just saying, man, I was used by God in this incredible way that a kingdom turned around. And so what's incredible about this, that we see Elijah, who's full of confidence, courage, and boldness for the Lord. We see God come through from, for Elijah in a mighty way and even brought water. Uh, and I read this thinking, man, I want to be Elisha. I want to be this guy. I want, to, I want to be so right in the middle of what God is doing and I just ride that cloud. You think he had no worries in the world because he had all the courage and boldness. But something shifted. Something changed for Elijah. Look at verse 1 in chapter 19. He said, Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, may the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life like the life of one of them by the time tomorrow. So she throws down the gauntlet. Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba, uh, that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there, but he went on a day's journey to the wilderness. He sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. So he's right in the middle of this, of what God is doing, and God is using him in a mighty way and then discouragement set in because adversity showed up. What I really want us to see in this is that it doesn't matter if you have the greatest prayer life that you've ever had, you're the closest to the Lord that you've ever been, discouragement can still happen. In Elijah, he was in the greatest place that God used him in a great way and discouragement took place. And it's in that pivotal moment that we have to, decide are we going to feed that discouragement or are we going to defeat it because this is what elijah is at that place and he's allowing discouragement to take over right to the point of he's asking god to end his life i mean this man just saw something that we probably will never see in that capacity we see miracles all the time but in that capacity he said lord let this fire be consumed and in front of his eyes a fire took off out of nowhere 
And he saw that and he experienced that. He was in the middle of that. And then he prayed for rain and then rain happened. And yet discouragement still took him, still rocked him. He was approached with adversity that planted the seed of discouragement. See, church, you can have the most incredible moment with God and still be struck by discouragement. Being a believer doesn't mean that we have a magic void button for trials, but being a believer means that we have everything we need to overcome them. And that's something we have to remember. So now I want, I want to give you four causes of discouragement. I'm going to try to go through these quickly. Four causes of discouragement. Uh, so that we can be aware. Now, you might experience one of these. You might experience all of these. Elijah experienced all of these. Uh, and you might experience all of these at, at some point in your life. And we have to be aware so that we can defeat it rather than be overcome by discouragement. The first one is fatigue, right? Everything is weakened when you're tired. Uh, I have two young kids, right? We, we got camp season. We got all kinds of things going on. It's pretty common to be tired, and fatigue, or drugged up, I guess. But, <laughs> but when, we, when it weakens, when fatigue sit, sets, it weakens our ability to be rational, to be selfless, and it's a great opportunity for our integrity to fall because we let everything down, we let our guard down, and it becomes all about how do we get through this moment, and it's just survival mode. It's a terrible time to make decisions when you're tired. If your ability to discern, which is a spiritual gift, is no longer guiding you, instead you are being driven by your emotions and feelings, you may be suffering from fatigue. Right? Fatigue can cause burnout, no passion, no drive, no vision, all things that God wants you to, to live by. But that burnout will, will take place and, and overcome you. Elijah just finished an epic throwdown, and he was tired and exhausted, which gave him no defense against discouragement. And so he just gave in. He fed it. He, he didn't fight it because he was already so tired. So we have fatigue. We have frustrations. Frustration can often get in the way and allow us to feed discouragement. Discouragement often comes when you do the right thing but experience poor results, right? Frustration occurs when our, ex our expectations aren't met. I mean, think about your husband, your wife, your children, your boss, your employers. Think about when you were the most frustrated lately, and a majority of the time it's because you had certain expectations that weren't met, and that frustration plants the seed of discouragement, and it grows because we don't communicate or we don't deal with it. If you really think about it. It's usually because our expectations aren't met. You see, Elijah, as he sits on that frustration with his head between his legs, and he gnaws at it, he doesn't deal with it. He sits on it. He sits in solitude, uh, and it just overtakes him, and he just becomes frustrated, becomes tired, and all that, and it starts consuming him, just like that ivy I was talking about. It becomes poisonous. If you're waiting to live... If you're waiting to live in a perfect world with perfect situations with perfect people, I'm sorry to say you're going to live the rest of your life frustrated because it's not going to happen. Where there are people, there is always opportunity for discouragement and disappointment and frustrations. I used to have a student like 10 years ago at the last church I served at, and I mean, he dealt with all kinds of mental issues or mental uh, struggles, uh, anxiety, depression. He was a little bit bipolar too. But he's just one of those kids that knew exactly what button to push. You know what I'm talking about? And he would push it. And it, it would overtake me. I would get so frustrated with him. I'd get so angry that I would be dealing with it for days. And then a voice just came over me. In that moment, after weeks of dealing with it, a voice came over me and said, Joseph, how weak are you that you let a teenager dictate your heart? I don't want to hear that, Lord. I don't want to hear that. Because we let frustrations, we let our expectations that aren't met consume us, right? We allow it ha to happen. The, there's this whole myth that the devil comes in and, and messes with your heart, but the devil has no bearing on your internal self. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that any, where there is Jesus, uh, the enemy can come in. Nowhere in Scripture. In fact, it says where there's a presence of Christ, there is no 
the devil cannot overcome, right? He says, just by the name of Jesus, he will flee. Well, if Jesus is within you, as we believe he is, right, he has no bearing on us. Can he affect things externally? Absolutely. But he can't manipulate your heart. You do that. We give him way too much credit. There's so much frustration that can happen by allowing discouragement just to gnaw at us, gnaw at us. The third thing is failure. Failure is a hard pill to swallow. Nobody wants it, and everybody experiences it at some point. One of the greatest symptoms of discouragement from failure is self-deprivation. So two things. We belittle others through our failures, right? It's their fault I failed. If they would have just helped me, if they would have just listened to me, if they, w- if they would have just began and, and to work on it, if they were just present, then we belittle others and say it's their fault that I'm failing. It's their fault that I'm discouraged. It's their fault that I'm dealing with this. And then the other way around, we belittle, we belittle ourselves. I must not be good enough if I'm dealing with this. Right? I must not be smart enough. What do I have, to, what do I have that they don't? And that discouragement just keeps taking on and taking on. In fact, Elijah said, take my life. I am no longer better than my ancestors. Right? He starts belittling himself. God says that you have value and purpose. Failure makes us believe that we do not. What seeds are we feeding? The seed of discouragement or the seed of God? What voice is stronger, the voice of discouragement or the voice of God? Because he sees value. He planted value in you. He He planted purpose in you. He doesn't make junk. He doesn't make, he's not, he doesn't, he's not an accidental God. You're not an accident, right? We can't let that frustration and failure get in the way. And the last one is fear. Elijah allowed the discouragement to turn to fear. In his mind, his problem was bigger than he was. He over-exaggerated. This is what we do in, in discouragement. We look at something, we allow that discouragement to take place, and then we build it up bigger than it originally was. We make it much bigger in our hearts and our mind, right? A guy, for example, a guy I worked with, John, he looked at me weird the other day when I came in five minutes late. Does does he think I'm I'm terrible at my job because I came in late? That's the second time this year. Does everybody in the office think that I'm terrible at my job because I came in late because John looked at me weird? Right? John may have told the boss is maybe everybody hates me at this point john looked at me weird sally said hi and said hello yesterday so i must be getting fired right we escalate this thing and that's a silly example what we escalate our problems all the time and turn them into something much bigger than ourselves so they over they overcome us and then we forget that god's much bigger than any problem that we have because we make it into a mountain we build it up we turn that fear into something that it's not And can I tell you something? Can I tell you a lie that we often tell ourselves? We often tell ourselves, God doesn't give us anything we can handle. That's wrong. That is wrong. Because God will never give us anything that he can't handle. If we can handle it, we wouldn't need him. We wouldn't need to pursue him. We wouldn't need to pray to him. We wouldn't need to have him on a daily basis. In fact, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 10, I don't believe it's up there. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, far above, beyond our ability to endure, so that they may despair of, its, of life itself. Indeed, we felt we have received a sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us, right? He will never give you something or allow yourself to come to a place that he cannot handle. Elijah forgot this, and God had to remind him of this. That's why he had to show up for him. In fact, we see it in the next few scriptures here. God then showed up. Look at verse 5 and, and chapter 19. We'll read a little bit more. Then he laid down and slept under a broom tree. This is Elijah. Suddenly an angel touched him, and the angel told him, get up and eat. Then he looked, and there at his head was a loaf of bread baked over hot stones and a jug of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. Then the angel 
of the Lord returned for a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for your journey will be too long for you. So he got up, ate, and drank. Then on the then on the strength from that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. He entered a cave there and spent the night. And it's that moment that he has this whole conversation with God. And God says, where have you been? What are you doing? Where are you mentally? Right? God showed up for him. He's in all this despair. He's, he's been overtaken by this fear, fatigue, frustration, and, and all of this. And then God showed up to switch his mind. And to remind him that he doesn't have to feed it. He doesn't have to live in discouragement. And so I talked about four causes of discouragement. I really want to quickly tell you about four discouragement killers or poison ivy killers. What do you want to say? The first one, if fatigue is something that increases our discouragement, rest is something that will kill it. Right? If you look at the first thing Elijah did is he rested. And you know what? For teenagers, it's not hard for you guys. You sleep, you sleep like 18 hours a day. I don't know how y'all do it. But for some of us, for adults, not so much, right? Some of us, four or five hours. Some of us, uh, more. Some of us, less. And you've been doing it for years. And so, Forbes magazine, actually, a couple secular sources, uh, recorded a scientific study that proves that rest reduces stress, boosts creativity, improves productivity, and enhances decision-making. All things that would come in uh, pretty well to combat discouragement, right? And rather letting it rest, that's the first thing Elijah done. He went through all this. He's exhausted. His emotions were awry. He's talking about killing, killing, killing himself. He was in a terrible moment, even after God just did something amazing. And then he rested, right? And then the angel comes and said, get up, eat. And then he rested some more. And it seemed like that was a big part in his healing process to overcome discouragement. So are you getting rest? And you know what? Uh, and you might ask, well, how do you get rest if off a of four or five hour sleep? Because there's no way I'm going to get more sleep. And I, there's Healthline magazine said this, you can get rest without sleeping eight hours a night. Here's a couple things you can do. Light exercise. Avoid excessive screen time. Reduce caffeine intake. Okay, 0 for 2. Uh, eat healthier. Avoid alcohol. Close your eyes and breathe. Right? All these things. What's funny is a lot of these things we go to to numb our minds when we're tired, but these are the very things that are causing us not to rest, which in turn is feeding our dis discouragement. It's kind of backwards a little bit. If Jesus can make time to rest when he was changing the world in three short years, I think we can make time. Right? Joseph, I have kids. You know, I have no time to rest. Listen, Jesus had 12 boys he had to deal with. Unless you have 12 boys, I'm just saying. Right? And they were very much childlike in their faith and in their maturity. Jesus often withdrew, often withdrew and rested. And he spent time with the Lord in that and renewed himself. And it, you know what? Every time he did that, and we see it as scripture unfolds, he did that in preparation for what was next because he has something big to do next. And so he'd go and, and rest and rest his mind mentally. He'd rest his self physically and spiritually. If Jesus, who is perfect, needs to do it, we who are imperfect need that much more of that time. We need to rest. The next thing I would encourage you to do is reset. Well, how do you reset? Well, you re reorganize your strengths, your thought, or excuse me, reorganize your thoughts, your atmosphere, or even the people around you. If all else fails, just step away for a second. Step away from the situation. Don't feed discouragement by staying in it. Change something. Right? Whether it's just you go for a walk, change your atmosphere, right? Maybe you're around negative people. Maybe you just step away. But you have to make the effort to reset. When things just don't seem to be working out and it keeps getting worse and worse, instead of allowing yourself to be poisoned with discouragement, step away. Step away from it. There's several times in the Bible that he tells you to just be still. In fact, Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. Just be still. Another one that I love, Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. You need to reset. You need to allow him to be God. 
breathe, reset, spend some time talking to the Lord. This takes effort. Elijah rested and the angel took him to the mountain uh, for a reset, right? Spending some time with the Lord. A lot of times when I'm in a moment of discouragement, I often spend significant significant time reading the word because it resets and refocuses my mind and my heart. And we need to reset in these moments of discouragement rather than just keep beating it over and over and over. Joshua 1.8 says meditate on it day and night. There's a reason for this. There's a reason he tells us this. Not only is it good for our spiritual walk, but it's good for our soul and our mind. We have to reset. The third thing, we have to remember. God then reminded Elijah who he was and what he was doing. We have to remember a few things. One, God is in control. We are not. The world does not revolve around you. The world revolves around the Lord who created it. He is in control. He is the one that gives you purpose and vision. He's the one that equips you to overcome this. Him, not you. He gives you the ability to do it. John 16, 22 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You know what's crazy about this verse is that we have lost sight of what this is saying. It says, I told you things so that you may have peace in the midst of trouble. We want to separate these things. Like, we have a time of peace, and then we have a time of trouble. No, he's saying, you can have peace in the midst of the trouble because of who God is. We have to remember that because we want to keep fighting these battles over and over by ourselves, and it keeps like an ivy affecting us and overcoming us, and we're letting it happen. And he said, no, you can have peace in the middle of this. You just have to trust me. You have to remember that I am God. You are not, right? He is in charge. He's perfect. We're not. So uh, Moses and Jesus and this old man went golfing one day. Yeah, this is a true story. Um, Moses gets up, hits the ball. It's a terrible shot. It goes right for the water. Of course, Moses being Moses, he's like, oh, splits the water. Ball bounces on the ground and hits the green. Jesus says, nice shot, man. But thanks. Jesus gets up, hits the ball, tees off. He's doing the same thing, going right for the water. Well, he's Jesus. He's like, it bounces off the top of the water, and it gets on the green because, you know, Jesus can walk on water. Yeah. Uh, Moses says, hey, great shot. Jesus is like, I know. Uh, And then the old man gets up. He hits a terrible slice, and it, well, slice, it goes up, and it starts fading toward the woods. Well, all of a sudden, this random bird out of the tree just came flying in, grabbed that ball, started flying toward the green, but accidentally drops it right before the green, and it starts heading for the water. Well, a fish jumps out of this water, does a crazy flip, hits it, the tail hits the ball, lands three feet from the green, from the hole, and then this random squirrel comes out of the woods and grabs that ball and puts it in the hole. And Moses turns to Jesus and says, bro, you got to stop bringing your dad. <laughs> God is perfect. We are not. God is perfect. We're not perfect. Right? We have to remember that, that he is God. And the fourth thing is that we have to resist. We have to take the first step. There's a very important part of this message that you have to catch hold of. The angel did not come in the picture and forge or force change on Elijah's heart. This is not how God operates. He does not intervene in your heart, right? He reminds you of his goodness and he provides for us, but your heart is your decision, right? A lot of times we just pray, God, come in here and change me, change me, and reach down in me and shift my thoughts and my hearts and all this kind of stuff. But he never did that with Elijah. He sent an angel to remind him, to encourage him, to build him up, to live his own life. God's not going to miraculously change your heart. You're going to have to do something about it. You're going to have to make the effort. You're going to have to get up and eat. You're going to have to get up. You're going to have to walk away. You're going to have to step away. You're going to have to stop feeding discouragement. You have to do that. He says he's going to help you. He's going to be there for you. He's going to encourage you. He's going to be God because he is God. And he's going to love you and work with you throughout the whole way. But you're going to have to make the decision to get up. This is on you. 
God responds to Elijah, and Pastor hit on it last week. Again, get up. Do something. We aren't going to avoid it, so don't feed it. Defeat it. Overcome it. Fight back. Don't constantly give into it. He has given you everything that you need to be an overcomer. We just have to embrace it and walk through it. He's given you everything. He's equipped you. He's given you the word. He's given you all kinds of ammunition to go against discouragement, but we like to feed it and live in it because we think that's a normal way of life because we're so used to it. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And we have to convince ourselves of this. We have to remind ourselves of this. This is not the normal way to live. It's to constantly live in discouragement. He says there is peace in the trouble. And you can have that peace. You just have to grab a hold of it. You have to live in that. Josiah, you can head on up. Discouragement is a poisonous ivy that has the potential to devastate you if not dealt with. It robs you of life. It numbs you of your potential. And it ruins great friendships and suffocates the spirit inside of us. Uh, William Ward said, discouragement is, is, a, is dissatisfaction with the past, distaste for the present, and distrust of the future. It's an ingratitude of the blessings of yesterday, indifference of the opportunity of today, and insecurity regarding strength for tomorrow. It is unawareness of the presence of beauty, unconcerned of the needs of the fellow man, and unbelief uh, of the promise of old. It is impatient with time, immaturity of thoughts, and impoliteness of God. That's discouragement. And many of us are waiting on the sidelines, waiting for God just to come in and supernaturally shift our hearts when he's just telling you to get up. You've got to take the first step. He says, I'll help you, but you've got to put an effort. Right? You just living in it in solitude and letting it, he can't do anything with that. You've got to have a willingness to step forward and, and overcome it. We can't just sit in it. God has too much potential in you for you just to sit around and be taken over by this poisonous ivy called discouragement. We've got to embrace the life he's given us, not sit in the enemy's tool constantly. And he's already given you the ability to overcome and break your way through. You just have to take the steps and have faith that God's going to get you through. If you don't know Jesus, you'll never overcome it. That's the reality. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're going to live in this for the rest of your life until you make a decision. Because God is the overcomer who gives us the ability to overcome. God is the overcomer. He's the only constant uh, in our lives that will help us overcome discouragement, anxiety, depression, all this stuff. And if you don't have him on your side, you're never going to get through it. I'm just going to be honest with you. Rest in the Lord. Allow him to reset your heart. Remind yourself of his goodness and resist the seat of discouragement with the armor of God. You are a warrior. Be a warrior. You are a warrior because he's made you that way. And I'll leave you with this, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is seen. Not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. He wants to make an eternal difference in your life by helping you overcome the battles of this world and being able to to love on people and share your story and show your, your story of being an overcomer as well. There's so many people that need to hear this message and the only way they're going to hear it is through your ability to overcome. We have to be overcome. We've got to be warriors. Would you bow your head? I just want you to sit in this for a second. And this might not be you right now. You might not be in a place of discouragement. I'm not encouraging you to be. But it's going to happen eventually. And many of you, I mean, hands were raised around this whole room, and many of you are dealing with it right now. What are you going to do with it? You're going to feed it? You're going to let it overcome you? You're going to let it rob you of what God is trying to do in your life? Or are you going to defeat it? You're going to overcome it. He's already given you the ability to do that. 
So I first want to pray for those who don't know Jesus, or excuse me, for those who do know Jesus who are going through something right now. If that's you, if you just if you have a relationship with the Lord, but you're going through a, a time of discouragement, would you raise your hand? Yeah, hands all over the room. I just want to pray for you specifically. Father, I just pray for these men and women who love you but are in an opportunity or are in a moment of despair, of discouragement. Give them the ability to move forward and overcome it, not feed it, not give into it, not let the enemy uh, remind them of the worthlessness that comes with discouragement, but Father, give them the, the promises that you've given them to overcome. Saturate. I pray as they walk out of this place, they walk with their head held high knowing that they have a God that is much bigger than any problem that we have. Lord, let us walk out of this building as warriors ready to tackle what the enemy is going to throw at us. Let it not defeat us, Father. Now I want to pray for those who aren't believers. If you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord, if you don't, you've never been a time in your life where you just gave him your all, you surrendered yourself, and you're so eat up with discouragement and the, the, the craziness of the world, and you're thinking, this is the time to change. I need to change things right now. If that's you, raise your hand. Anybody in this room? Father, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. Lord, whether we have the courage to raise our hand or not, you are moving and you are working and you're trying to constantly remind us that we need you. We can't do this alone. And I pray, Father, that you would just saturate the hearts in this room, that we'd be motivated to know you better, that we draw closer to you, that we would be equipped with the things to overcome by reading your word, by spending time with you. And I pray that you would move big in this place, Lord. And whatever the, the things that are on our heart that is messing with us, Father, we just pray that you put your hand on them and you belittle the situations, that you lower them in our hearts so that we can trust you more, Father. And I thank you for what you're going to do because I know that's going to be something, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would y'all celebrate the Lord this morning? Come on. Yeah. He is good. It really is an amazing thing when you remind yourself of the goodness of God and all that he can do through us. Right? You look at Elijah's life. There is there's one significant difference between us and Elijah. Elijah was taken over by discouragement, but, but we have something that he didn't. We have the Holy Spirit. Right, who planted in us to help us overcome. So we have the very God within us that Elijah did not. So we have everything we need to tackle this world. And not only tackle it, but to thrive, not to survive. Sometimes we live in survival mode all the time. But God did not die for us to live in survival mode. Jesus died and rose so that we can live in thrive mode. Right, we can embrace this life and get everything that he wants for us. It's incredible. God is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our love. So we thank you for being here. Uh, we do have a few announcements before we do. If the uh, servant leaders would come forward. Uh, we, there are envelopes in the back of your pew. Uh, if you would like to give your tithe or offering. I'd also encourage you, Pastor reminded me to encourage you as well, that we do have kids camp coming up. So if you feel led to give toward that, uh, we never make any money. It's not, we're not trying to make money off it. We always get in a negative at kids camp because we have so many that need sponsorships. And then we also had to throw away a bunch of food just recently because the power went out and some of that was for kids camp. So if you, if the Lord lays it on your heart to give toward that, that'd be great and do that today. Uh, of course, we still have students that need to be sponsored for Forge Camp. Just pray about it and see if God can use you and, and your funds to do something that's eternal rather than something temporary with your, your money. I encourage you to do that. But uh, you guys can go ahead. And, as we give today, we'll believe in God for jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates, returns, debts demolished, rules to receive, favor, and success to the kingdom. You guys give it up for Jerome. He's going to do announcements today.